talk time to get started. My name is Diane Goldenberg Hart. I'm with the Coalition for Network Information, CNI, and you have reached a webinar that is part of CNI's Spring 2020 virtual membership meeting. And we're so glad that you made some time out of your day to join us here today. Uh, today's webinar will be a panel discussion, including um, conversation about current trends and issues in discovery systems, uh, talking about various kinds of features, user behaviors, identifying needs by analyzing transaction logs, and also using artificial intelligence and machine learning for discovery. Our panelists will also be talking about the recent Ohio Link and Ithaca white paper um, on user-centered library systems and the concept of full library discovery. You may have uh, been fortunate enough to catch a talk on that report that we also had at CNI um, in April. And uh, we will chat out a link to that video if you didn't get a chance to see that. Our talk today is entitled Discovery Systems in 2020, Issues and Trends. And we'll be hearing from four speakers. We'll be hearing from uh, Lorcan Dempsey of OCLC, Tom Kramer of Stanford University, and uh, Bill Michaud, and Michael Norman of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Before I hand it over to our speakers, I just want to orient you very quickly to a few features of the webinar environment. One is that we have a Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says Q&A. If you click on that, box will pop up. You can simply type in your questions or your comments in that box at any time. And after our panelists are, are, have completed their entire presentation, I'll come back on to moderate those questions. We also have a chat box, as I alluded to earlier. We'll be sharing some information with you there, but you should also feel free to use that chat box to communicate with us and communicate with the other attendees on this webinar. So without further ado, I want to thank everyone once, one more time for uh, being with us here today and a special thank you to our panelists for their presentation today. And with that, it's over to you, Lorcan. Thank you uh, very much, Diane. Uh, pleased to be here. Uh, when we were talking about this session, uh, Bill suggested that I uh, say a few things maybe by way of general introduction, but also uh, say a little bit about the BTAA uh, Operationalizing Collective Collections Report and uh, full, uh, full library discovery, uh, as was mentioned. Given uh, that times have changed uh, somewhat since uh, that discussion and uh, we're in unusual circumstances, it seemed to me that um, it, it would be sensible to say a little bit about uh, rediscovering uh, discovery in a changed uh, environment. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about three things very, very briefly um, that are really quite high level and uh, I think will uh, impact and change the way we think about discovery over the next while. They accelerate uh, current trends. The, uh, my um, comments are partly based on uh, three sources I just thought I'd, I'd put up very quickly. Uh, resource Discovery for the 21st Century Library. I have an introduction in this volume. It's coming out next month from Facet Publishing in the UK. The BTA report that was mentioned. Um, and then uh, I released a blog entry a couple of days talking, uh, a couple of days ago, talking about the ways in which uh, collections have changed in the uh, current environment, the way in which we think about collections differently, the way in which the relationship between the library and the collection has changed. The, the library collecting activity, as it were, has peeled away from the, the locally uh, managed collection in various ways. So, I'm going to talk about three things, and I'm going to relate each of those three things to a pandemic effect. Um, so uh, one of the things we're seeing at the moment is a lot of discussion about uh, what will change, what will persist, uh, what will be accelerated, what might go away. So um, uh, three pandemic effects have been very pronounced in the library context. First, obviously, there's been a forced migration online, but I think the uh, effect of that is as people begin to interact with services online, we really begin to think about what does a holistic online experience mean? What does it mean to provide the full library experience 
in an online environment. The second thing is uh, really a focus on mission. Universities and colleges are really now very focused on their distinctive impact, very focused on uh, where they should be putting emphasis, very focused on strategic directions when they come out of uh, the, the current situation. And I think for libraries, um, there's going to be an increased focus on alignment with evolving institutional priorities. And this means that um, they will want to optimize. There will be uh, pressure on budgets. Uh, there will be pressure on institutional uh, alignment uh, being seen to contribute to institutional priorities at a uh, critical time, at a difficult time. So online, on mission and optimize. And I'm going to say a little bit about a, a, a discovery effect of those three pandemic effects. So a little bit about full library discovery, a little bit about the discoverability of institutional assets in the context of a focus on research, and then uh, under optimize, uh, stretching a little bit, thinking about D2D discovery to delivery, but suggesting that increasingly we're going to think about D2D in the context of decision support or dashboard. Uh, that increasingly we're going to have um, data-driven decisions, we're going to want to think about how, how to optimize things in the context of uh, data, usage data, uh, traffic that suggests uh, behaviors, choices, and so on. So uh, discovery to delivery to dashboard. Okay. So first of all, uh, holistic uh, online experience. Now I am using PowerPoint in, in the way it was supposed to be used here with uh, lots of bullet points. Um, I've, I've uh, shifted back to bullet points for this uh, presentation. So I think one of the effects, uh, one of the pandemic effects we see is that uh, the library identity uh, is, is, is this sort of strange hybrid between a set of services and an actual building, a physical manifestation, um, uh, symbolically manifest uh, on, on campuses. And I think one of the um, effects of the uh, pandemic will be to make that fully online experience very real and the experience of the library and the identity of the library manifest in that online um, experience. And this means as a target or as a new target uh, on, on the horizon moving forward, we're going to have more pressure to think about how to deliver fully online, how to deliver the full range and richness of the library experience online. So you have things like consultation and expertise. You have uh, how do you substitute for the face-to-face -face interaction that creates the relationships that allows you to develop research support or other services. Clearly there are information integration issues, uh, integrating into learning management, uh, interaction and programming, big focus on um, uh, personal uh, interaction. You know, we've had a uh, discussion about customer relationship management systems, but also profiling over the years and uh, how to get into the user flow, how to uh, use social more. So I think all of these things, mixes of these things going to become more prevalent as we think about that fully online um, library experience. At the same time, we're seeing a new relationship between uh, collections and uh, the library, a new relationship between the library and collections. Increasingly, we're thinking about facilitating access to collections that may not be locally owned and curated. We're thinking about collective access to collections across groups of libraries, across um, consortia. Um, so our model of collections was of uh, the careful construction of a locally acquired collection. But in a sense, even though we, that's still quite central to library organization and operation, a lot of what we do has, has moved away from that because now what we're really thinking about is how do you optimally satisfy research and learning needs from a facilitated network of resources. There are uh, resources that are acquired locally. There are uh, resources that um, are collaboratively provided. There's open resources, there's uh, commercial resources. So. We still provide literature search and so on through that discovery layer, but you don't own everything in the discovery layer. Resource guides are really interesting phenomenon. They're like tribbles in, in Star Trek. They, you, you looked in the room once and there were two or three of them and now all libraries have all of these resource guides. And 
This is a signal, if you like, I mean, a signal of various things, but one thing is that you're facilitating access to a range of things that are arrayed around the needs of that particular course, that particular subject, that particular area. Clearly, big emphasis on open access, thinking about how to uh, deploy, array, uh, open access resources, how to access them more effectively, open educational resources. We facilitate access to a whole array then of network resources, free network resources, and try and tie library resources into those. At the same time, even, you know, we connect to acquisitions, we connect to um, ways in which discovery connects to um, ways in which we acquire materials to demand-driven acquisition. We're offering spot acquisitions, the ability to order a document. Increasingly, we'll see more smart fulfillment around resource sharing, the integration of acquisition, resource sharing, discovery to develop a, a richer view onto what is available to um, uh, the person. You know, we, we will buy the professor the book from Amazon rather than um, uh, request it if it's not available within a certain amount of time. So this whole whole set of services beginning to provide facilitated access to a network of resources. And interestingly, we used to be in a situation where the collection drove discovery. You know, you had a collection and you wanted to discover what was in the collection. In a demand-driven or a facilitated um, environment, that sort of flipped a little bit. You know, d discovery, what, what somebody has access to tends to sometimes uh, influence or drive the collection. Um, and what comes out of this um, uh, as an early manifestation is a focus on full library discovery, thinking about not just access to a literature research, but access to the range of materials that you facilitate access to. And I think over the next while, we might see a sort of trend uh, emerge here where you have different uh, levels. So historically then, uh, the library provided um, access to the acquired library collection. The, the, what was bought and licensed, she provided discovery to that. We're beginning to see through uh, bento box displays, through a focus on full library discovery, and um, um, Bill will talk about this in a while, access to the website, to events, to various things, to programs, access to expertise by pulling up um, uh, relevant uh, li librarians or, or uh, experts in response to a particular um, uh, query. And, access to a broader facilitated collection. Yes, you have the articles, you have the library catalog, but you also have a, a web search. Um, you have potentially access to Google Scholar, various other things. So we're beginning to see this broader array of things pulled in. Now, beyond that, over the horizon again, there's how do we think about that full library experience? So I think we're seeing a move as the uh, library experience and uh, library discoveries are peeled away from that library collection to think about this broader array. And currently we're sort of thinking about an array of services across wider aspects of the library. And I think uh, that trend will continue as we think about that full library experience. The second thing um, I said uh, was important was thinking about the mission. So, uh, we did some work a while ago with Ithaca uh, SNR where we sort of pulled out a, a model saying that uh, universities tend to have three poles, uh, three emphases, and these will vary depending on the, the institution that you're in. You, clearly, there's a distinctive uh, research uh, focus where doctoral research scholarship, but then, you know, a focus on liberal education, broad undergraduate education. And for many institutions, quite a strong focus on preparation for professions, on credentialing, on moving forward. And most institutions will have a combination of these, but they will um, um, lean uh, one way or the other. And consortia are quite interesting because they contain a mix of, of these quite often. BTAA less so because it's a consortium of peers. Ohio Link, uh, very much so. You have Case Western Reserve University, you have Ohio State, very strong in research, very strong in undergraduate education. You have a somewhere like Franklin University, very strong in career preparation. Other institutions, very strong in undergraduate education. But universities are going to get much more purposeful, much clearer about where their distinctive uh, value resides and uh, sharpening what they do to um, 
uh, deliver value in that context. And I think one result of that is thinking in the context of a CNI audience, thinking about research institutions, um, and thinking about what has happened over the last while where research itself uh, has been affected by the pandemic. So a strong pandemic effect um, is the impact on the research culture that you know, we're experiencing uh, all around us. Um, now, so, sort of temporary, temporary ceasing of some types of laboratory research, but at the same time, really big focus on short circuiting processes and pra practices to get material, to get research outputs out earlier, big focus on collaboration across disciplines, across institutions, urgency about uh, reporting results, much greater use of open channels, and then concern about assessing validity and, and uh, relevance, which has really come up in the last uh, week or two. At the same time, we could look at the way in which publishers are making uh, deals for uh, temporary access, uh, various other things that are sort of changing the way in which we think about how research is communicated. Some of that will bound back, will rebound, some of that might stick, but we're, we're in this period of questioning also about research stronger desire to showcase expertise, potential contribution um, uh, within the institution. So I think we'll see coming out of this research libraries much more purposefully curating, managing, making more discoverable research outputs like preprints and research data, and also uh, becoming maybe more involved in uh, the disclosure, the uh, discoverability of expertise on campus in a way that's uh, already quite common in um, other, other parts of the world and, and um, uh, a lot of activity in the US as well. The um, very clear, we're, we're very familiar with uh, how this manifests itself, but I think this focus on discoverability of institutional resources uh, will grow. Currently, uh, when we talk about discovery, quite often we talk about discovery of outside in resources, the ability to find articles, the ability to find books, the ability, ability to find resources more generally. I think one of the things that we'll see in research institutions now is this focus on discoverability of inside out resources, discoverability of institutional assets, institutional materials. So things like um, um, uh, research data, preprints, institutional repository. And I, I quite like the way the Purdue webpage is organized because it very clearly shows at the top you have the discovery uh, discovery of materials might be. And at the bottom, you have discoverability of Purdue assets, Purdue intellectual outputs. So you have Purdue EPUBs, the institutional repository, publications, you have e-archives, special collections and archives, and then you have PER, which uh, gives access to research data. So these are all institutional assets that you're interested in sharing with the world. And the dynamic is very different here because Sure, you want your local population to see these and understand what you have. But from a reputational point of view, from a scholarly point of view, uh, from a dissemination point of view, you want to share these materials with the rest of the world. You want to push them out. You want to make them discoverable. So that inside out focus uh, becoming more interesting. At the same time, we have seen um, quite a few libraries becoming involved in the development of expertise systems on campus. This is the one at Minnesota where you're looking at faculty profile and outputs and sharing those with the world. Number three, optimize. Everybody is going to be very focused on optimizing against particular goals, optimizing their collections, their services. And really you have to choose the goals. And, and you know, in a teaching and learning institution, you will be very optimized on immediate support for learning, uh, student success, uh, retention, thinking about that new uh, experience. Um, some other environments you, you may optimize for other things. Just thinking about collections, there'll be uh, much more optimizing for value and the discussion with uh, publishers is very interesting in that regard. Probably more optimizing for open, certainly for curricular support and um, some emphasis on uh, regional local affairs. Um, a big push towards collaboration, I'd suggest there will be more um, collaboration. And I think one area that will um, maybe get a bit more emphasis is pluralizing collections, diversifying collections, representing and respecting uh, communities that are overlooked, shunned, ignored um, um, in the context of um, uh, collections that have been developed um, according to uh, certain characteristics or, or criteria. 
Um, so all of this means though, that there will be an increased emphasis on decision support because to optimize, you need data. You need to understand um, uh, how things are being used, um, what's not used, how to really focus in on um, uh, uh, to, uh, making choices. So data is required to support choices and that leads to dashboard. Now, Bill uh, had, had suggested talking about the uh, operationalizing the collective collection report, which we did for BTAA uh, last year. And really here, what we were looking at was discovery to delivery, the complex array of services within a major library consortium that allows them to share materials across uh, uh, those uh, libraries. And discovery in that context is part of a very complex ecosystem because Illinois is part of BTAA. It's also part of Illinois Infrastructure. Ohio is in OhioLink. Rutgers is in Palsy, but also in a variety of other uh, organizations potentially. So we have a very rich, very diverse, very complex ecosystem within which uh, libraries are sharing material and making decisions about their um, collections. At the same time, these are large, relatively autonomous, self-standing, uh, relatively wealthy institutions that, that, that are building large uh, collections, Illinois, good example. So what we recommended at a very high level is that the libraries begin to think about the optimal distribution of collections. How do you begin to manage your collections at the, at the level of the consortium as well as at the level of the institution to mean that libraries can specialize because the network will take care of things they're not specializing in or uh, that uh, shared print facilities are in, in particular areas or that you do eventually move to a prospective uh, coordination model where you share interest in subjects. But thinking about the distribution of collections across this uh, optimal distribution, this needs to be supported by efficient network fulfillment, tying together the various um, requesting delivery discovery systems that currently exist in a smarter way. But all of this depends on system-wide awareness. This all depends on knowing what's available, knowing where it is, knowing what terms it's available under. And a lot of the inefficiency of the current system is that you lack forward knowledge of those things. The systems have to go and look, or people have to make joins between systems. So it's a very uh, fragmented uh, environment. So from a system-wide awareness point of view, what we were saying was that increasingly we will see uh, the need to think about more data-driven uh, decisions, more data-driven systems, more data-driven choices around integrations, choices around where collections go, distribution of uh, collections. And this will mean sort of greater integration between discovery, resource sharing and acquisition because they're all about making choices about materials. It will mean greater um, coordination between shared print, digitization, specialization at individual institutions. All of this depends on better system-wide awareness, better data. It depends on dashboarding, pulling transaction data, holdings data, um, acquisitions data into uh, 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 a way of looking at things. Now, this is very aspirational, it's on the horizon, but we can see that we're sort of gradually moving in this direction where we want to have ways of making decisions about collections that um, um, discovery can contribute data to, but then because we're in this facilitated environment might be influenced by uh, what happens. We can see in the uh, licensing arena, consortium manager in Rome um, from the same company, but a lot of data about uh, what uh, is being bought. Unsub um, 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 recently uh, renamed, a lot of coverage uh, around that at the moment. We provide green glass in the monographs area. So I think increasingly we're going to see dashboards uh, decision support systems that help manage this increasingly fluid way in which we look at collections. So the discovery choices will be made in data-driven environments that they help shape because uh, choices that people making discovery uh, uh, can be um, factored in, you have downloads, you have you know, the, the, the whole way in which they play in this ecosystem. But then in turn, they're shaped by because you want to offer for discovery things that you recognize are valuable. So in this sort of more collective, more facilitated, more fluid environment, really sort of beginning to see data play a bigger part. 
So that was uh, what I wanted to say, rediscovering discovery, three examples of how the current changes may make us think a little bit differently about discovery very much in a library environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lorcan. I uh, assume everybody can see my uh, screen here. Um, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, Michael and I are going to talk a little bit about um, um, really an extension of what we did in 2017 at a CNI briefing. Um, discovery trends in particular, we're going to talk about uh, Bentel systems, uh, what we learned from transaction log analysis, and then uh, uh, some of the other elements that are going into what we're seeing is really a sort of a transformation in discovery. Uh, Lorcan touched on a lot of those points and I, and I think that's a, a very good introduction. Uh, again, we've also opted here a little bit for uh, putting together some fairly dense slides. Um, uh, idea being that these can be useful for later reference. And um, um, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. So, we're still thinking that library discovery is, is at a crossroads. Uh, Roger wrote, uh, Roger Schoenfeld wrote uh, a, a nice briefing in 2014 about uh, uh, academic libraries reconsidering their vision for discovery. Um, uh, Tom and his group has done a lot of work at Stanford and there's a quote here from Catherine Coleman uh, about a revolution in discovery and he's gonna talk about that later. And then uh, the Ohio Link uh, white paper which was uh, uh, referenced uh, um, by Diane um, and she also uh, actually gave you a link to this so it's earlier presentation. Um, this is this uh, uh, Ohio link of manifesto essentially, which uh, uh, basically uh, is proposing that uh, we re-examine uh, how we're designing uh, ILS systems and discovery systems. Uh, that typically they've centered on the, on the uh, uh, collection and not on the user. And that uh, what we need to do is look at systems that uh, are much more uh, uh, user dependent. Uh, they talk a lot about some of the things that Lorcan mentioned, the full library discovery, <clears throat> inside out libraries, and providing uh, modern business intelligence uh, to uh, uh, library systems. Again, I'm just gonna go over this quickly. <clears throat> full library discovery is something that a lot of people <clears throat> have tried to incorporate now into discovery systems. We spent a lot of time working on this, uh, moving beyond the retrieval of collection materials, including local information, local services, local content. In our case, we've integrated websites, uh, web guide information, subject specialist lists, course management content, et cetera. Uh, and the goal is really to bundle and interconnect these related uh, information services, this interoperability. Uh, briefly, historically, um, there's a few of you that can still remember what we used to call super catalogs with uh, that loaded uh, abstracting and indexing services. Some of you remember when we uh, libraries were loading the BRS software locally and uh, loading indexing services. We moved from there to federated search systems to web scale discovery systems, which are now used literally in thousands of academic libraries. Web scale discovery systems are characterized by having the uh, metadata full text content aggregated into a single consolidated index. So you're searching one large system. Um, more recently, we've seen the introduction uh, of what are really hybrid Bento style systems that, that do utilize uh, uh, some broadcast searching, some federated searching techniques, uh, but they're typically done over the top of web scale discovery systems. Uh, web Bento systems are characterized with, uh, by having the result displays presented in a zoned or a partitioned screen display uh, with content grouped by type and material. So typically there's a search for articles, a search for books, a search for on the library website, a search for uh, journals by title, et cetera. Um, there's a very rich, rich literature on web scale discovery services. Um, there's a nice bibliography by Francois Renoval, uh, it's the University of Liege. Um, they, the literature centers around a number of issues that are connected with web scale discovery services. 
Uh, one is a general confusion with blended result displays. So a lot of people that moved into bento displays or bento uh, style systems uh, are basically doing this in reaction to uh, user's concern with uh, scene displays that, that blend book uh, results, monographic results, uh, journal article results, dissertations, newspaper articles, all into one result display. This affects known item retrieval and the relevancy rankings. Uh, you might be doing a known item search and it would be on the second or third page of a, a blended result display in a web scale discovery system. We also are seeing things about uh, that uh, uh, concerns about the lack of full library discovery, the lack of access to local services, and uh, concerns about better addressing known item searching. Advantages of a bento type system, again, is it does partition results by material type and format. One of the things that we found and others have found is that a large percentage of searches that have been, that are done by users are uh, known item searches. But they address the web scale discovery issues of blended results, uh, relevancy ranking, known item access, they incorporate full library discovery features, uh, and they are able to provide nice one-click links out to full text. Uh, this is something that a number of us have been working on uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, expedite full text retrieval and bypass the link resolver. Um, example of our page, uh, we're going to talk about some of the specifics here. Uh, Walken showed a, a, a slide of this also. Typically, if you look at the results in the uh, articles page on the upper left hand side, you'll see uh, links to open access articles, links to the table of contents, PDF links, uh, links to article data. Um, if you look at the article link on the upper left, number two, you'll see links to data sets. Um, and uh, these are all done by essentially integrating uh, a, a number of uh, what are basically siloed services uh, into, the, into the bento style display. And here's a, a sort of a model of uh, our display and the elements in the, uh, in the bento display. We have a suggestion box, uh, articles on the left, catalog items on the, on the, in the center, subject suggestions on the right. We have a, a place to do some advertising. And uh, uh, this all makes up our bento style display. The features in, in our bento system, uh, we provide a lot of context specific adaptive search assistance, uh, spelling suggestions, uh, links to libguides, direct links for frequently uh, performed searches, uh, limit suggestions. We identify DOI, so the person types a DOI and we put a link to, directly to the uh, dxdoi.org or doi.org site. Um, a link to our Ask a Librarian uh, online chat, uh, journal title links, direct links to PDF when available, uh, DOI publisher open URL, custom value added links. We're, next slide talks about that. Uh, we also try to uh, rec uh, recommend several relevant subject uh, ANI services and provide links to, the, uh, to those that when clicked on open up at the point of completed search and then librarian and departmental library subject content. Uh, again, these are all uh, following in the philosophy of providing full library discovery. Specifically, uh, in terms of our system, we've added a number of sort of value added links over the top of the article APIs. So we use uh, EBSCO EDS and Scopus API for article results. Uh, we take these results, take the DOI, DOIs out of these results, and they asynchronously go, go out and uh, provide links to uh, clickable altmetric badges to give the altmetric attention scores. Um, using Scolex, we pull out the data set and article data links. On paywall pulls out the open access links. Browsing pulls out the uh, uh, direct PDF links that issue table content links. The, the PDF links are uh, complement the links we get from the EBSCO Discovery Service. Here's a list, and um, I don't expect you to memorize this, of the Bento libraries that we're following. Um, you can go back and refer to this later if you want to look at some of the, uh, some of the examples. Um, we're looking at about 42 different uh, 
dental libraries, academic libraries right now. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, we've, we found in the last year about 10 libraries have dropped the dental approach. So this used to be a figure that was over 50 libraries. Some of those are Primo installations, and we're going to talk a little bit about the problems with uh, Primo APIs later. Uh, but we've, uh, we have a nice spreadsheet that sort of characterizes the features, feature sets of all of these bento style uh, instances. They all have the books and article area. So everybody is recommending uh, uh, monographs from the online catalog and uh, articles from typically a web scale discovery service. And uh, the web scale discovery services that are being used for articles, uh, you'll see a, a, most, a good number of them are using Summon, but a number of them are using Primo and the EBSCO uh, discovery service. In addition to the articles and books, uh, we're finding that uh, website search is probably the most popular uh, in terms of what else is being provided. There's 34 of the 42 providing that. Research guides, some 24. Uh, journal title uh, links or journal title searches. Databases, digital collections, uh, search repository. Uh, contacts, uh, which is something that uh, uh, a number of us are providing has grown uh, dramatically recently, and it's, it's about 18 libraries providing that. So uh, in terms of observations about these bento systems, the uh, feature sets vary. A lot of bento versions do not do spell checking, do not provide top level direct links. Uh, spell checking turns out to be critically important. Uh, you'll see later when we look at an analysis of our click-throughs. Uh, only three employ uh, the one click to full text without going through the link resolver uh, option which our users at Illinois find very, very useful. Um, the OPAC uh, uh, varies. Sometimes it's a separate application like ViewFind or Blacklight. Sometimes it's part of the web scale discovery service. So we are seeing systems where uh, the catalog results are from the web scale service, article results from the web scale service, uh, perhaps the uh, archives and manuscript results or digital collections might also be from the Web scale service, but they'll just be in separate Bento uh, uh, windows. Bento provides a lot of local control and customization. You can see that by looking at the various options, uh, various uh, uh, options that people have been using. But it does require uh, programming, service staff, maintenance, and uh, a fairly uh, significant amount of work to uh, locally maintain a, a particular system. There are a couple of systems now that are available uh, that are being used in, in more than one institution, but a lot of the systems are still homegrown. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, custom transaction logs. Uh, we think it's very important to look at user search behaviors and what we learn from user search behaviors. We have uh, a very heavily instrumented uh, transaction log a program. Uh, it records all user actions, suggestions the system makes, all those search room formulations, uh, identify sessions on all the click-throughs. The click-throughs are actually uh, routed through an, uh, one of our websites where they're recorded and then redirected. So we know uh, click-throughs into external resources. We have a lot of transaction logs uh, going back something like 11 or 12 years. Latest study goes up to April 2018, where we looked at a million and a half searches uh, and a million and a half click-throughs, and then took out a sample of about 5,400 searches where we redid the searches, analyzed these for type of search, success rate, particular user behaviors. Two important points, two or three important points here. One of the things that we've seen is that the average words per query is going up dramatically. So we're now at 6.1 words per query. There's a lot of copy and paste searching where people are taking results. We also know this from our focus group interviews and from a user survey we did last year where people are searching Google or Google Scholar, uh, pulling out uh, references and pasting them into our system. There are only about two, a little over two searches per session. 60% of the sessions are one search. Uh, when we look at the use of our suggestions, about 20% of the searches the suggestions made and almost a third of those, the person follows a suggestion, particularly the did you mean spelling suggestions and direct links. We're seeing a, local, a lot of local uh, DOI searches. 
Um, this has been growing over the years. This is the uh, Sci-Hub phenomenon where people will love to put a DOI into a system and uh, pull up the full text. The other really important point is that in the sample of these 5,400 searches, we found that about 64% of them now, which has gone up in the last time we looked at this, are known item searches. Often these are title word searches, uh, author and a couple words from the titles, in many cases a full citation. In fact, when we looked at the sample, a uh, percentage and a half of these searches were known item, which isn't a lot in the sample, but this extrapolates to 45 per day where people are literally copying and pasting a full citation into our system. If we look at the usage within the Bento, our article links are 58% or 57% of the usage. Books and monographs uh, uh, less, the, the uh, OPAC. A lot of use of our suggestions, added links, even the, some things like the library links or context, which is one tenth of 1%, it still means it's more than once, uh, happening more than once a day. In fact, if you look at the click through actions here um, uh, for last month or the month of April, 141,000 searches. 3,700 or almost 4,000 clicks per day. Full, full text clicks are 1,600 per day. Uh, a lot of clicks into browsing, a lot of clicks into our uh, Bing API uh, results. The did you mean spelling suggestion is 55 per day. So those systems that don't offer spelling suggestions or don't offer a, a did you mean, uh, you can see how heavily that's used literally 55 times a day in our system. The open access links, 20 per day. This has been increasing since we started uh, remote teaching at, the, at Illinois. The direct link suggestions, these are the commonly uh, frequent searches of about 20 per day. Uh, a to Z journalist, about 20 a day. Ask a librarian four times a day. And again, even emailing a subject librarian uh, twice per day. We have a lot of library services that are not used every day. So uh, having a service that's used twice a day we would consider it successful. Um, we did a easy search user survey, November 2019, about 483 responses, 230 users providing comments. 24 of the respondents were daily users of the system and 40% of them were daily or weekly users. Uh, we got a lot of nice suggestions, but there was a high level of satisfaction with the entire Bento approach. Um, I'm going to put, I'll put up one slide here, which is uh, uh, a question here about uh, discovery in general. And I think a lot of the literature kind of centers around this. It has to do with whether or not libraries should even be the starting point for users seeking content. There's a nice Ithaca S plus R survey question about how important is the gateway function, which dipped over the years and now has gone back up. So there, there's a growing consensus, I think, uh, among users that the library is, in fact, a valid starting point. You might argue that library systems have always played a supplementary role, and that's true in many cases. Um, and you might also argue, and a lot of people have, that our focus should be on aiding known item discovery. We've done an awful lot in our system, and you can see that with the known item searches at 64%, that uh, the importance of providing access to known items searches. Uh, number of plans here for next steps within uh, Bento systems. Uh, you, you can take a look at this. There's a lot of mega indexes, and especially discovery uh, services. These are dimensions and lens. Tom's going to talk about machine learning and AI techniques. Uh, we still have a lot of complementary digital services, linked open data, data management services, publication metrics, visualizations, course management content, factory profile systems uh, that we can uh, add in. I'm going to turn this over to Michael now, who's going to talk a little bit about our uh, Primo implementation. Right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, hopefully you can hear me uh, on mute there. Uh, but yeah, Bill and I thought it'd be a good idea to just give you a little introduction to um, uh, the implementation that we're going through for um, Primo. And so in June 2020, uh, we're going to be migrating to Ex Libris Alma and the Primo VE uh, systems. And uh, that's going to, that's really a new deployment model that combines the back end processes of both Alma and Primo into one integrated platform. Uh, currently, we work with separate systems in that with uh, Voyager and um, uh, our 
catalog discovery is viewfind. So uh, that will be a new process for us of, of, of really going into this co combined back end processes and then um, you know, really almost in real time, that being reflected in the Primo VE uh, library catalog. And we're uh, transitioning uh, with the 91 other, 90 other libraries in the iShare consortia. So, uh, and then what kind of systems are Alma and Primo V? Um, Alma really is a unified resource management system that allows libraries to manage their print, but really what we're looking forward to is helping manage our electronic resources and services really in this single environment. Uh, that's that's going to be a big change for us. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, for an electronic title, uh, uh, just a reminder to everybody, Alma really creates an electronic inventory, so a portfolio uh, that really then permeates uh, Alma uh, uh, and uh, associates the electronic access in Primo, uh, so a Primo catalog and all instances that it really can match on identifiers. So Alma also has a network zone that we're really getting accustomed to uh, that takes over the function of that union catalog. Uh, the network zone, um, we've, we've encountered some problems with that uh, within in the consortia. The network zone is really built on a, a using a first-in premise. Uh, and that is really the first copy that comes into the catalog, the union catalog, this network zone, really becomes the master record uh, for the consortia. And this master record uh, is a shared bibliographic record that is linked uh, to our local holdings or the local holdings of each of the libraries that have that, that title, that, that material. And uh, much of our local data, and we do have a lot of it, uh, particularly in our rare books and special collections uh, materials, uh, really didn't migrate over from Voyager into that master record. And so we've been doing a lot of customization work to reintroduce that local information. There are ways to do it, but it, we're, we're, we are having to put some time and effort into that. And then one of the big issues uh, that we've encountered, and Bill can talk more about this, is really these localized URLs uh, to e-resources populating the master record. This would be a link to a res electronic resource that one of the other iShare libraries may have, and, it, and then that pops into the master record, but we may not have access to it, or it has their proxy uh, appended to it. So um, we've, we've run into some issues with that. So. Uh, just important, even though we do have access to Primo um, through the, with the consortia, we actually had access to Primo um, six, seven years ago. We had a pilot where we had access to it for, for about three years, and then we went away from it, and so now we've come back to it. But uh, we do want to emphasize that Easy Search Bento will remain the library's primary and default discovery service available basically in the single search box on the library's gate, uh, white web page. Um, Primo will replace Viewfind as the catalog search. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we're doing that uh, here in a later slide, but uh, we are really testing uh, certain features of the Primo Central Index, uh, particularly the ProQuest collections, which when we had Primo previously, uh, six, seven years ago, um, we did not have access to the, the, the ProQuest collections, uh, a lot of their newspaper collections at that time. And so now we do. Uh, and so uh, we're testing a lot of those features with the Primo Central Index. And uh, we do still continue to see uh, the benefits of really these separate bento zones. Uh, here, Bill uh, has got the image up of um, our, our library's front gateway. So there's the single search box. Uh, when you do a search within it, then you get results. And so again, as Bill was showing earlier and Lorcan was showing earlier, you've got your article section there. Uh, you've got your, in the middle there is our library catalog. And so uh, here in a few weeks, um, Primo will be, um, will be uh, populating that. And then um, uh, one of the things we're looking forward to, we've been testing and we may be able to offer, uh, since we do have access to the Primo Central Index, uh, the Primo Central Discovery Index, is uh, newspaper articles. And we've had some of our users, as Bill was doing some of these um, uh, surveys, is that, or, or, or comments, uh, is that newspapers is one of the things that maybe they'd like to see emphasized a little better. And so we do have access to that. What we've run into, um, <laughs> it's really painful right now that we're work, trying to work through is these uh, API issues. And Bill mentioned this, and I mentioned a little earlier, is that uh, we are currently using the Primo Search API to pull in results from the library catalog uh, into EasySearch. 
And um, we are very pleased with how quickly results came in from ViewFind. And it, it, many times it's, it's less than a second to pull in those results, uh, but average is maybe one to two seconds response time. Uh, with Primo, we're encountering really some slowness in performance of those, those with those APIs and um, the results coming back through those API calls. And it's really averaging about 10 to 11 seconds per search. And, and we're getting a lot of comments from testers about just how slow that is. And so API performance for the Primo catalog really, really def definitely needs to be optimized and improved to gain really the full benefits we have of easy search right now. And we've been working with Ex Libris. Uh, we were hoping that maybe some improvements are coming here in a few weeks. And, but those APIs are just, just really critical. And you saw all the APIs that Bill mentioned that he's pulled into, uh, into the articles, uh, being able to pull in some of this other, uh, other information. So um, I think that's the last slide there, but. Um, yeah, we can turn it over to Tom. Yeah. Hmm. One second, let me find the right screen to share. Uh, this looks like it. All right, that appears to be working correctly on my end, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to almost be in San Diego with you. I uh, kind of wish I were there right now after two and a half months at home. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a different facet of discovery, which is uh, some of the things that seem to be emerging right now um, on, the, on the leading edge, in some cases the bleeding edge, uh, but which may uh, soon become core parts of all of our discovery environments in one way or another. Um, the first of them is linked data. Um, and I used to do a lot of work with Dean Kraft of Cornell, and he had this beautiful slide showing Eden and the Tower of Babel and how linked data would be able to uh, basically be a, a babblefish um, and allow uh, us to work collectively across all of the different schema and vocabularies, ontologies and domains where we have our data. Uh, and I think we, we still haven't re achieved that, uh, but we are making some progress. And one of the areas where I think uh, the progress is most notable and where linked data is most important is when linked data serves as the bridge or the gateway between library data and our ways of uh, representing knowledge and resources and that of the, the web in general. And we really look at this in two ways, um, getting library data out onto the web for discovery, reuse, and linking, but also pulling uh, data from the wider web into our environments. And uh, as beautiful and as much fun as it is to, to talk about ontologies and RDF and um, uh, the semantic web, really uh, where most libraries are interested in linked data is because it's going to enhance discovery. Um, and so uh, through the LD4P and the LD4L uh, projects and the series of projects that have been funded by the Mellon, Foundation and in partnership uh, primarily between Cornell, Stanford, Harvard University, and the University of Iowa, um, we've been focusing most recently on seeing if we can augment existing discovery environments uh, with linked data features. Uh, one thing that we do know about linked data is that it's not going to appear quickly uh, and it's not going to appear magically where one day everyone is using mark-based systems in the current environment and then the next day we'll be in this new um, uh, wonderful and somehow different world where everyone is using different interfaces, different systems, and different feeds. So we've focused um, as part of the LD4P grants and the LD4 community on trying to do incremental enhancements to existing discovery environments. And we've identified five areas where we think this might be most fruitful. Um, the, those are represented here, and I'll give you a sample pattern for each one of these and where I think we're seeing some progress and where we're seeing some challenges. Um, the first represents to, um, a way to get library data out onto the web in general. And um, in many cases, many of our catalogs are being indexed by uh, Google and other um, harvesters and search engines. One way to accelerate that is by doing better and more rigorous schema markup. Uh, so schema.org markup in their catalogs. 
This exposes the data to harvesters where it can be incorporated into the web of data and then uh, eventually emerge through uh, search engine optimization and higher searches. Uh, we have, over the course of the LD4T project, um, seen some progress on this. We're by and large focusing on Blacklight as an open source application using Solar underneath um, for a couple of reasons. One is that lots of the LD4P institutions are using Blacklight. Two, it's open source and using common technologies, which even if you're using Viewfind or if you're using um, a commercial search engine, a lot of the lessons and techniques are portable. Uh, the second area, and this really exemplifies bringing external data from the web into library discovery environments, is knowledge panels. And I think people are generally familiar with this from Google. Uh, we're now beginning to see this more and more commonly within library discovery interfaces. I believe it's, uh, it's now a feature that is included in Primo, or at least some Primo instances. And this is a great example from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which has a, a home-built discovery environment, where they put a lot of work into integrating the knowledge panel, but also um, building a service around it, including uh, what are the ethical and service considerations for when they find bad data. We're um, doing more work and more consideration about how to get better forms of browse. And I think it's telling that most browse interfaces from uh, this decade look like they may have been uh, coded or designed 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Um, spatial browse seems to be the one, um, the one exception to that, and we're seeing some good breakthroughs there. A semantic search. Uh, so instead of searching just on the text, can you search on the meaning of the text? So if I search for heart attack, could I actually get uh, search results for myocardial infarctions? Uh, the best example of this, and this is using um, uh, MeSH from uh, the National Library of Medicine and a search there. Uh, this is yet to become a uh, common technology or, or a common appearance in library, most library search engines, but uh, perhaps this is on our, on our future. And then finally, as, as Bill was suggesting, I was really glad to see this. Um, the type ahead, auto suggest, and spell check suggestions really have a chance to see um, people helping with both known article search but also general browse. And uh, progress on this, especially semantically aware progress, would be a great advance. We've seen some very good work on this from the University of Ghent in Belgium, uh, who recently presented on a, a Blacklight Link Data. Uh, workshop that we held at Stanford last September and October. Uh, of all of these techniques, um, the one that seems the most relevant and the most visible is the knowledge panels. And at this same workshop that I just referenced, uh, about 25 people came together and began to crowdsource a document on how to add a knowledge panel to your existing discovery environment. Um, this document is linked. Uh, you can see the bit.ly at the bottom, so bit.ly ld4 uh, dash kp dash recipe, and it's written as a how-to document. It's currently draft, but it covers everything from what is a knowledge panel and why you might want to use it to identifying uh, data sources, um, considering uh, the minimum amount of data that you need to have a quality display, and then the technical strategies for uh, actually uh, implementing it. Um, if you are interested in any of these techniques, any of these advances, or if you have your own advances that are working with linked data, we would welcome you in the LD4 Discovery Affinity Group. Uh, this is a, a set of biweekly calls that are open to anyone. Uh, there's an extensive knowledge base that has been built up um, over about the last, uh, it must be eight months or one year at this point. And uh, the co-chairs are Huda Khan from Cornell University and Jesse Keck from Stanford. And you can see at the bottom, um, or if you do a search on LD4 Discovery Affinity Group, is not surprisingly the first result that you'll find. The other area that I would like to forecast just briefly is artificial intelligence and the potential to impact library discovery. Um, I believe there are two big opportunities emerging specific to discovery. Now, there are a lot of places and a lot of ways that artificial intelligence uh, is going to and has already affected uh, the library, the library services and the information environment. This includes backup house operations, this includes digital curation, this includes things like chatbots and reference services. But specifically on discovery, I think we're seeing that artificial intelligence introduces, uh, it just changes the equation in terms of the kinds of metadata that are possible to um, derive and produce. 
And it also hints at new opportunities around new interfaces. So um, artificial intelligence is something that might scale in a way that our libraries, our technical services departments, um, and even the networks of, of data exchange are, have been unable to do or at, at the same pace, at the same scale, um, and the, at the same expanse. And looking at the common techniques that are really emerging as now, not even state of the art, but uh, very commonplace in many different industries, the ability to process lots of different formats of information, whether it's text, images, or time-based media, are really able to generate lots of what looks like traditional based metadata. So this could be techniques for named entity recognition or text classification for texts, for images um, doing aboutness or labeling for descriptive metadata generation, or recognizing objects that are within an image, which might be helpful for description or just extracting parts like better OCR. Um, for time-based media, uh, speech-to-text is uh, really a game-changer, not only in accessibility, but just overall discovery. And there's lots of examples where structural analysis of things like video allow uh, people to pick apart these complex time-based objects and get just the captions or just the segments that are interesting. I think all of these techniques are going to become standard for uh, library uh, processing in the not-too-distant future. I think actually within the next five years, if not 10. The second opportunity that we're really seeing emerge with uh, artificial intelligence is new interfaces. I think one of the best examples of this, uh, there's actually some um, academic ones uh, that I could cite, but none that I could find right before this presentation running in production. But Google is one that you might be familiar with, and it's uh, reverse image search. Um, so by entering an image, can you find other images that are like this? So here's an example of a, a, a killer rabbit from medieval times. If you paste this into Google Images, you'll actually find lots of different um, images that are like this. Now, this can be done completely without any text um, and without any descriptive metadata. It's a potentially revolutionary approach. Uh, we also see uh, different types of interfaces for different types of recognition. This is an example of a knowledge graph exploration from UNO, uh, which might be familiar with people in this audience. And this is actually interesting because there are two ways to enter this. One is by uh, keyword search of a concept, but another by, is by uploading or um, examining an existing document. Uh, UNO will uh, understand what the concepts are within that document and then draw links to other documents and other concepts within this environment. It's a completely different kind of discovery and search, very different from uh, known item searching or even keyword searching. At Stanford, um, I must admit, we are still getting our feet under us for AI. And I, I think the exciting thing is that's probably true almost everywhere, even people who are far ahead of us, we're still at the very beginning of the revolution. Um, we have two sets of projects going. Uh, one is around theses and dissertations. And can we do more and richer um, uh, descriptive metadata and descriptive work on these to enhance discovery? We happen to have the full text for the theses and dissertations that were deposited electronically at Stanford. So this is a rich proving ground. Uh, and currently we're looking at comparing multiple different models and seeing how we might expose the richer metadata through various interfaces. Uh, we're doing the same thing with images, with uh, image labeling, with object recognition, and with uh, image-based search. So my cl uh, colleague at Stanford, Claudia Engel, has done a great case study comparing what happens when you use commercial search engines or commercial uh, uh, machine learning engines, clarify Google and AutoML, uh, Google, the Cloud Vision and AutoML, and how good are these for academic purposes? Uh, and you, at the bottom of this, you can see some of the results they've been uh, working with, with um, basically underdescribed set of 50,000 images taken from an archaeological dig over the last 20 years. Um, as I said, I think we are all collectively at the beginning of this, and there's a real opportunity for libraries, archives, and museums to better understand and to build our own capacity for leveraging artificial intelligence at, for discovery, but for other areas as well. Uh, with the National Library of Norway, the British Library, the Smithsonian Institute, and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Stanford is helping form a uh, open community, uh, which looks very similar to others in the space, um, for things like IIIF, and is in fact patterned after IIIF, 
is can we collectively work together to understand what the use cases are, build common technologies, models, and capacity building. So if anyone is interested or is already active in artificial intelligence, we invite you to start participating in this as well. And with that, I will end and see if there is any time for Q&A and discussions, and I think for uh, any of the panelists. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, what a wonderful sweeping overview of discovery systems, the demands on these systems, the potential, really extraordinary. Thank you so much for that great um, uh, collection of presentations. And uh, given the hour, I'm mindful of folks' uh, time, and we already do have some questions. So let me just dive right in beginning with uh, Rob Cardellano, who comments uh, regarding Primo with 10 to 11 seconds per search, question mark. What are reasonable performance expectations for, for search? Shouldn't it be sub, uh, sub second response for API queries as we already have today via solar? Uh, I would, uh, yes, that's what I would anticipate. Bill can probably talk better on this than I can, but yeah, we did a little study just to get that information back to Ex Libris about the API calls uh, and just the speed that those were coming back. And and so um, that's that's what the time is on those. And so we're, we're they, they've actually done some modifications to the Primo search API to see if they can speed that up. And then we're also uh, one, we're gonna be on production uh, server farm here uh, in a few weeks. And so we're hoping that that might speed up some of the activity too. But, but Bill, you, you would know more about performance of APIs than I would. A uh, typical search for us, um, uh, we will use uh, EBSCO API, Scopus, uh, uh, Open Paywall, uh, uh, Scolix, uh, Altmetric, um, I think the other ones, uh, Browsing, uh, Bing. So we'll send out 10 or 15 uh, asynchronous searches at one time to get things back in a matter of seconds. A uh, VU Find is the other uh, very fast one. So yeah, a, a response time that we're seeing in a and in, in that's anything above four seconds is really unacceptable okay. and unusual. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for that question, Rob. All right. Uh, the next question comes from Stephen Bell. When you talk about AI in discovery, could that include voice bots that can search the discovery layer and return results on a screen or send to an email and work with common search assistants people have on their phones in homes, et cetera? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll answer that though. Others might want to jump in as well. Um, there's one of the, uh, at the Fantastic Futures conferences that we've held for the last two years, um, much of the activity around AI has been around uh, natural language understanding and uh, conversational agents. So clearly this is a, a, a different modality for uh, conducting queries. And one of the interesting things to me is the way um, the AI stacks upon itself. Um, Karen Cariani from WGBH uh, has been very active in a, um, uh, using AI for better understanding and access to videos. And um, what she and her colleagues at Brandeis University have demonstrated is it's actually parsing, a, uh, teasing apart a video is about nine or 11 different functions that stack on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So if you do segment analysis and you fit, find out where the captions are, you extract the captions, then you do the OCR on the captions, and then you do entity extraction on the extracted text. So I think conversational agents are just one more link in this chain. Interesting. I, I'd also add that Eric Freiberg from EBSCO EDS does a demo of uh, the use of Alexa with, uh, with uh, EBSCO EDS for uh, voice of search and the results are, are, are spoken back to. Interesting. So it's a very rich area. Larkin, you seem to be on mute if you're talking. We're, we're all um, experimenting with uh, Alexa, certainly. There's, uh, I mean, there still is a gap. Just thinking from my own experience, you know, um, asking for Irish names or, or various other things. It's, it's, uh, but it's, it's definitely worth exploration, yeah. Interesting. Thanks, Stephen. Now another question. Um, 
Thanks for the wonderful and rich presentation. The complexity of the sources that need to be managed is unbelievably complex. I don't mean this question to come across as a kind of, well, what have you done for me lately question, but many libraries are struggling also to integrate museum objects into their discovery systems. Can someone comment on that aspect of discovery? <laughs> Someone wants to take that one, huh? <laughs> we need to add another panelist, I think. <laughs> I, I can, uh, we, we've looked at doing this with a couple of different, the Archaeology Center at Stanford and also the museum. And I, the challenge, or one of the challenges, is just the differences in the level of description and also the schema. It's mm -hmm. just the interfaces are, are um, and what the indices expect and what the patrons might expect given the current layouts for library-based environments are very challenging. It seems to me that, that Bento actually could be a good approach to this and also approaches like um, knowledge panels or like uh, hyperlinks that link out to other types of environments uh, are potentially successful ways of dealing with this. We've been part of an immersive scholarship grant that uh, was awarded uh, um, to uh, North Carolina State University, and we've been looking at uh, um, the virtual reality implementations and um, um, uh, I guess a lot of different uh, um, emerging uh, immersive technologies. And these are all very fertile areas. And, and at some point, we need to we need to try to integrate some of these things. Um, We're moving forward on a lot of fronts. I, I just I just thought I would put that question out to our attendees as well. If if there's anyone in the audience who has any experience with this or thoughts about it, um, if you just raise your hand, I can turn your uh, microphone on and you can um, participate live here in the conversation. Since um, we still do have quite a large audience, um, but that's a great question, uh, and thank you so much for bringing that to our panel today. Uh, and uh, just to relay from Rob Cardellano, um, who asked about the uh, search search times, he just uh, thanks you for your responses and his comment is that these were all great presentations. So thank you so much. And just to reiterate what I said, I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna, I, it was, if there aren't obvious questions, I was wondering if I could ask Bill, um, one of the things I'm curious about if your research has uncovered where are library patrons typically starting their search? The library homepage, Bento, or the catalog? I don't know if you have any data on that. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's interesting because we just had a recent discussion about this. Um, and we kind of looked at the literature. You know, the Ithaca SPSR survey asked people where do they start their searches. There's been a couple of other large surveys of uh, of users asking, you know, do you start your search at an AI service or at the catalog or at uh, a search engine or in the library? And, um, and, and of course, there's varying answers, and people are starting their searches in all these different places. Um, some of this for, for us comes down to this idea that uh, uh, we want to be able to provide the best delivery services we can. So, you know, we know that people are starting at Google or Google Scholar. Um, they're going, they're coming in from off campus now, which everybody is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they don't have the proxy uh, link in front of the uh, uh, Google Scholar search. And in fact, it's impossible to even do this within Google uh, to put a proxy in front. They're being asked to pay for articles. They're being asked to, uh, to uh, uh, log into articles. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people doing these copy and paste searching where they're literally taking something from Google or Google Scholar and pasting it into our system. And we're really encouraging that. We're, we're, we're hearing that in the user surveys. Uh, we, heard, we saw that in our, the survey we did in November. And um, you know, I, again, I think better integration of all these different silos is what we're all trying to do. Uh, I, that's, I, the, um... that's the uh, holy grail. The uh, the museum question uh, was interesting. I mean, just going back to Tom's answer and, and some of what Bill was saying, it seems to me that um, 
you know, for a long time, we, we were very obsessed with Google-like searches, um, but even Google doesn't do Google-like searches anymore. Um, uh, you know, you do a Google search and you get back a, a set, you get back a river of results. I mean, there's a load of advertising at the top, but you know, they have the knowledge card. If there are scholarly articles, they pull them out. If there are images, they pull them out. If there's news, they pull that out. So, I mean, effectively, they're giving you a, a sort of bento style result without the boxes. Um, so, as I say, even Google doesn't do a, a Google-like search anymore. So, I think, you know, Tom's point about the different, uh, you know, library archive, museum, shared searching, cross-domain searching, as, you know, uh, called it in a previous life, you, you know, a big aspiration for many years. And uh, because of the different curatorial traditions, the different metadata traditions, the, the, the different orientations of the services, difficult to pull together. But I, I do think the sort of more bento style uh, approach might be interesting there, but also the linked data. Uh, I mean, one of the things uh, we're doing and we're, we're, we're working with um, uh, Tom and his, his colleagues in this context is, you know, uh, with Mellon uh, support developing entity backbones. I think over time, if people share, um, so if, if we have uh, persistent identifiers for uh, people, for places, for a variety of things, and we begin to share that infrastructure and have those identifiers in our descriptions and our discovery layers, it gives you a way of connecting things together at some level, but it, but it's still some way out, some way out in the future. And it, it sort of um, interfaces then can take advantage of some of those uh, ways of, of doing things. but. Uh, uh, different contexts or domains can link to uh, similar or, or, you know, link to the same um, entity uh, infrastructure for um, particular shared entities. I, I, I think in the future, that's um, um, something that we should see more of. And we see it happening already with Wikidata and so on. Yeah. So, so Lisa Hinchliffe brought up a good point here in the chat that uh, the where do you start question uh, uh, differs a little bit about whether or not you're doing a node item search or a topical search. And, and uh, the relevancy, relevancy ranking of these services, I think is really critically important. Uh, I, for classes I teach, I typically do a demo of Google Scholar and uh, pull it up and do a search for the term federated search. And what I find typically is that the first handful of results is an article that uh, I co-wrote in 1999. Well, if I was going to tell people uh, or give people information on a, on the topic federated search, a 1999 article is not going to be very useful. And even I've written 20 articles since then that have been more, more relevant. So uh, uh, we do a lot of analysis of relevancy ranking in these web scale systems and in uh, AI services, and I think that's a really critical, a really critical element. Thank you. Thank you all for your thoughts. Thanks, Lisa, for that comment. Um, if we have any other questions, please feel free to type those in. Um, and inviting any attendees who wish to still um, hang around and have a chat with our panelists, please do so. And with a final uh, sincere thanks to our panelists for your time uh, sharing your um, experience and uh, this valuable information with us at CNI and to our attendees for making time to be with us here today. So thank you everyone and be well. Yeah, thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you, Diane. Thanks. Thank you.